The Huts are the most recent addition to Thrawn's Revenge and Fall of the Republic, and today we're going to talk about how to best slug it out with the other powers of the galaxy, covering the government mechanics, economy, and roster of the Huts in both mods. We'll start with the economy since that's the exact same between Thrawn's Revenge and Fall of the Republic, but it's also where they differ the most from other factions. Like all factions, they can build trade ports which increase in value based on the number of connected friendly planets but the main money of the Huts comes from a life of crime. The Huts are the masters of the underworld in Star Wars, so rather than getting most of their income from their own worlds being taxed more, they get it from everyone else. Huts get the base value of all their own planets, but they don't build tax agencies. Instead, they build cantinas. These don't give credits directly, but they allow you to build smugglers and increase the total number of smugglers you can build. These smugglers can be deployed over enemy planets, which happens by placing them in one of the planet's space slots and waiting until the next week change, at which point they'll be absorbed. After that, you're legally entitled to 20% of the value of that planet's base income. Up to five smugglers can be deployed on a planet at any time, meaning you can get up to the full base income from a planet since it's 20% per smuggler. And all of this can happen without you controlling the planet. You can't smuggle from your own planets, however. So you are always capped off at 100% of the base income of a planet. You'll want to prioritize planets with high base incomes like Geonosis, Bothawi, and Christophsis in this example, while smuggling from a planet like Hypori with zero base income will not get you any extra credits. Up to five smugglers can be deployed on a planet, but only one will deploy per cycle, so for the fastest results, you may want to spread out between a few different planets, rather than piling all five onto one enemy planet at once and having to wait five cycles for them all to deploy. And keep in mind the total number of smugglers you can deploy is limited by the number of cantinas you have, so make sure you stay on top of that. You can track this information as well as seeing where your network is and what level each planet is at on the government information screen, accessed with the centered icon on the left side of the screen. The only way other factions can reduce your network level currently is through that planet being conquered, which drops the level slightly, so try to account for active battlefronts before sending your smugglers in. With this kind of economic function not requiring the Huts to expand their territory to expand their income in most situations, the Huts are really well suited to build tall rather than wide, really packing their planets up before expanding. This makes them a very defensively oriented faction, and they have another factional mechanic which really helps their defense of this territory. This is called Bhutana Hutta or the Garden of the Huts, named for an almost sacred territory in Hut space where Hut families left their differences at the door and the secret defense fleets of the Huts were held throughout the millennia. This mechanic allows them to pull in extra ships to defensive battles from a pool you create on the galactic level by sending units into the garden. This is done by going to a planet with a valid ship choice over it, basically meaning any ship from corvette to capital size with sails, and then you build the option which shows up in the political build options menu. This will remove the ship from your galactic forces, but in tactical defensive battles you'll be able to build an upgrade from the shipyard to call that ship in and assist with the defense. If the ship survives, it'll return to service on the galactic level. This can mean with enough credits invested, any defensive battle can be turned into a victory, but you are spending a premium to have these ships, so it's important to decide when you're going to get enough out of a victory for that to be worth it. The ships take time to deploy, they take credits to deploy, and they join the battle at the opposite side of the map, often being cut off by enemy forces, so you'll need to rely on regular defenses while you get ships into position, and you need to make sure they don't get cut off. A strong show of force from Bhutana Hata, which can put you above the default population cap, may also force the enemy into an early retreat, saving you the planet but costing you a lot of credits for very few enemy casualties, so you ideally want to bring just enough to win, but not so many you'll scare the enemy off, or prevent them from bringing in any reserves. While the ships cost money to send into or call out of Butanahara, you do not pay upkeep on them while they're in the reserve pool. The final government mechanics for the huts relate to progression goals throughout the game, and tie into both of those prior mechanics. These are the hut mobilization path and the scum and villainy path. These are two scores that you'll be increasing throughout the game, and neither is mutually exclusive, so you can complete both paths. The Hut Mobilization Path unlocks new ships and heroes related to the Hut's in-universe rearmament in response to military threats. In Fall of the Republic, this culminates in the massive Dorbola Battlecruiser, the most powerful of the Hut's space units. 
Many of the units on the Fall of the Republic version of this path, including the Dorbola, are core parts of the regular roster in Thrawn's Revenge, where they're replaced by other, higher-tech ships in other roles like the Batil, Shalandian, and Tarada. So while the mechanics are the same and how you go along these paths, the rewards are different in each mod, and the things you unlock in Fall of the Republic are things you start with in Thrawn's Revenge. This path culminates with the Caravos, a second mainline capital ship for the faction in Thrawn's Revenge. Mobilization points are gained by sending ships to Butana Hutta, with the number of points you get being equal to the population value of the ship being sent. So you'll have a full score once you've sent 500 population cap worth of ships to Butana Hutta, although you can continue to send ships and pull them out throughout the game, you're not limited to 500 total. The Scum and Villainy Progress Bar, which you fill up by deploying smugglers, gives a couple units like the Boarding Shuttle in both mods, which you can use to capture enemy ships, but it primarily gives you hero units. Where the Dorbola represents the biggest, baddest ship to unlock in Fall of the Republic at the end of the mobilization path, in Thrawn's Revenge, the end of the Scum and Villainy path unlocks a super weapon called the Darksaber. This unit is basically the Hut's Super Star Destroyer, but it's mostly just armed with a single target super laser, which can be used to turn the tide of a battle, but is best used against fleets where you need to do a lot of damage to a single target, whether that's taking out a shipyard, an enemy battlecruiser, or to speed up breaking down a high level defensive station. You don't necessarily get as much out of its 100 pop cap requirement in battles where the enemy fleet is primarily composed of smaller, more numerous ships, though it can still provide some tankiness in those situations if that's what you need. In Fall of the Republic, this path is capped off by unlocking the Shadow Collective as part of your forces, with a bit of a hostile takeover from Darth Maul and his brother Savage Opris. These both join as powerful force-wielding heroes for you, something which is otherwise fairly rare for the Huts. In both mods, getting a good head start on both of these paths is typically a good idea. You're building your economy up by getting 100 smugglers out, the equivalent of 20 fully smuggled planets, and you're also setting up some good defensive options for you in Butana Hutta. All of this means you have a good solid base economically, and with powerful heroes unlocked through these processes to lead your expansion into other territories. With solid defenses and high rewards the more you build up Butana and your smuggling base, early on it's important to be selective in how and when you take territory. If you're looking for a real challenge, the Huts only start with a small handful of planets in the Clone Wars maps in Fall of the Republic, but in the known galaxy maps, and in all the progressive maps in Thrawn's Revenge, you'll have a bit more to work with. A lot of new players will often go to From the Ground Up where you also start with just a single planet, but those can be deceptively hard in Empire at War, even though it seems like you're managing less, so I don't recommend trying to learn the mod by jumping into those. In the progressive maps for the Huts, consolidating your territory and taking out any planets that separate your own is a definite early priority. So now we'll go over the units you'll be using to do that. Each mod has its own unique units, but the core of the Hut roster is the same in both, and the main strategies are going to be the same as well. The Huts tend to have thicker hulls and weaker shields, making them pretty bulky overall, and adding a fair amount of survivability to their hardpoints. They also have a high availability of physical munitions like assault concussion missile launchers, allowing them to take down enemy targets at range before engaging directly, and also allowing them to do a lot of upfront damage very quickly, though it does mean you need to be able to weather attacks from the enemy between waves of missiles, and if they take down your missile launchers in that time, you're going to be in more trouble. You'll usually want something pretty meaty to take the center of your fleet, and in both mods one option for this is the Voracious Carrier. This large ringed carrier won't put out much damage on its own, but it can take a beating and it's also going to provide a reasonable number of fighters for any fleet, making them useful if you want to have a fighter and bomber focus strategy, or if you want to just rely on primarily other ships that don't have fighters, which are pretty common in the Hut fleet. The Dorbola is naturally the biggest and bulkiest ship in your fleet, but they're more expensive and have to be unlocked in Fall of the Republic, so until that point having a few Voraciouses around will always be good. Even after that point, unless you're going very heavy on anti-fighter, you will probably still want a Voracious around with your Dorbola, because otherwise you will be typically lacking in fighters. Your mainline capital is going to be the Vontor, which can also take some hits with nearly 14,000 overall health and shields, while also being a pretty versatile damage threat. Much like the Imperial Star Destroyers, Vontors will fit into most fleet compositions, with their weapons including assault concussion missile launchers, as well as long-range heavy turbo lasers. 
The other unlockable capital ship exclusive to Thrawn's Revenge, the Karabos, also fits into this category, bringing the DPS and survivability significantly higher, but dropping a lot of the Vontor's versatile fighter capacity, meaning your Vontors can usually get by without having to work with a Voracious, but your Karabos probably does want to be paired with one. We already spoke about how choosing your engagements can be important, especially in making sure fleets don't get away once you've lured them into spraying a Butana Hut of fleet on them. And a key part of that will be interdiction. The Huts lack standard interdictors, instead relying on interdiction mines like all the factions in Fall of the Republic do. In Fall of the Republic, these come from your Galleon tenders, and in Thrawn's Revenge, they'll come from your Super Transport 7. Like with the other tenders, these are able to heal your ships as well, which is especially useful for the Huts, where the high health pools on individual hardpoints can already help them survive multiple salvos, so where other factions benefit a bit less from tenders on their capital ships, the Huts can make it a lot more worthwhile. A lot of people really overestimate how fast hardpoints will die when shields are down, but with the Huts it's especially true that you'll usually have a few rounds of enemy fire before a given hardpoint dies. On top of the more typical tenders, the Huts also have the Raka, a smaller tender dedicated to healing just fighters. But how do the Huts deal with enemy fighters? In Fall of the Republic, they're a bit more reliant on their own fighter swarms to hold off enemy fighters, as they only have the Light Minstrel for dedicated anti-fighter duty and point defense, at least from their standard shipyard rosters, but more on that later. In Thrawn's Revenge, the Warlord Corvette and the Ubrickian Frigate, which is definitely not ripped off from the Lancer, help to do the trick with higher rates of point defense, which shoots down enemy missiles that are incoming, and a broader ability to hold off enemy fighters. Both mods also have a heavy minstrel, but these are different per mod and they are not for anti-fighter. In the Clone Wars, the heavy minstrel helps with medium turbo laser damage, while the Thrawn's Revenge version has light ion cannons and light turbo lasers, making them close-up corvette hunters. Always remember that weapon gauge determines range, so heavy weapons fire farther, but lighter weapons are always more accurate, especially against smaller targets, so make sure to have a wide spread of weapon types, don't just load up on heavy turbo lasers or else you will struggle to kill enemy anti-fighter or enemy damage dealing corvettes. The remaining three smaller frigates in Fall of the Republic demonstrate these different types of weapons pretty well. The typically pirate Kaloth cruiser has a few light and medium turbo lasers along with some laser cannons, making them able to contribute to damage against most enemies, though they primarily want to be in closer up engagements against other enemy frigates and maybe some secondary fighter control. The Barabulla is armed with heavy turbo lasers and assault concussion missile launchers, making it a great choice to take on enemy capital ships from a safe distance, though enemy point defense will limit their effectiveness, so be careful where and when you deploy them. The Juvard has some lighter, lower range turbo lasers and missiles, but it also has its own point defense capabilities to help out the light minstrels and make sure that enemy fighters don't do too much damage if they get into your fleets. Moving up a level, we have the core frigates and cruisers, the Sajin and Karaga. The Sajin is pretty beefy and it's armed exclusively with light ions and turbo lasers, making it a good corvette and frigate hunter. But on top of the range differential, also remember lighter gauge weaponry comes with higher firing speeds. So while heavy weapons may go farther and do more damage on impact, they also have a higher likelihood to miss and they'll be down longer. So lighter weapons like the Sajin has can be helpful when you're looking for something to aggressively micro through enemy hardpoints after shields are down. All of this assumes that you're able to safely get in range, something that the higher hull and shield values on a Sajin will help with. Though it is still a frigate, so higher is a proportional term there. The Karaga, on the other hand, while it has medium instead of heavy turbo lasers, joins the Vontor and the Barabula in bringing significant quantities of long-range missiles to the battle. It's pretty highly skewed towards DPS, but it's still a hut ship so it can take a beating if it needs to, you just don't want to keep it on the front lines, it's not really benefiting from that at all. It has long range weapons and a proportionally lower hull strength. If you do go heavily towards ships with assault missiles, you'll want to concentrate fire on anything with point defense first. You won't be able to get your missiles past them, so overwhelming their ability to shoot down enemy missiles to take them out will also give you a lot more freedom to act. If you're trying to attack past a point defense unit, then you have to get through the full diameter of its ability to intercept missiles. If you attack them directly, then to make contact you only have to go through the radius. Both mods have other unlockable ships in various categories helping to fill out other roles. The Tempest is an unlockable research ship available early on in both mods, which brings some heavy ions to the table, something that's otherwise pretty rare in HUT fleets, and that makes them a great choice to go against larger Dreadnoughts or any Mon Calamari ship in Thrawn's Revenge, since in both of those situations getting the shields down is the important bit. 
Additionally, the Cossack cruiser and the Ubrikian cruiser, a hutified version of the Dreadnought heavy cruiser, are unlocked along the Mobilization Tree in Fall of the Republic, but both are always available in Thrawn's Revenge. The Cossack has a mix of medium turbo lasers and ion cannons, while the Ubrikian has heavy and light turbo lasers, as well as a higher amount of anti-fighter lasers. It's not particularly specialized, and its wide range of weapon types makes it a different kind of generalist, but that does mean it can support a fleet in long-range activities while still having some ability to engage enemy corvettes close up and protect your fleet if enemy fighters get into your back lines, which is one of the most important things. This will usually mean you want to have at least two or three of these in your fleets regardless of what you're doing, because they are fairly versatile, although you don't want to make them the backbone of your fleet. There are three other unlockable mobilization path ships only available in Thrawn's Revenge. The Batil is a medium carrier, something which the Huts can otherwise struggle with, and that means you'll have an extra way to build fighter based fleets on top of the Voracious and the Vontor. The Tirada is a bit like an upgraded Juvard, bringing some point defense and concussion missiles, but also some longer range heavy turbo lasers. Finally, the Chalandian is like the Karaga in that it's turbo lasers and assault missiles, but it skews a bit more towards the turbo lasers and how its damage is oriented, and its turbo lasers are heavy instead of light, making Chalandians and Tempest both critical parts of effective anti-station and anti-SSD fleets. All of the Chalandians' damage is going to be useful at a range against big targets, though you do want to make sure you have something like a Voracious or a Durbola to tank for them. Beyond these more core hut soar ships, the huts are also able to build a pirate refuge base as an alternative to their shipyard, giving more slowly producing ships of different types. In Fall of the Republic this includes the IPV-1 as an alternative anti-fighter corvette. The Consular and a laser-based dreadnought are also on that shipyard. In Thrawn's Revenge, the Consular is swapped for the Marauder Missile Cruiser, giving even more long-range missile options, and the Venator is added as a carrier option on top of that, with a unique weapon loadout inspired by the base game Venator. On ground, things work a little differently than in other factions. A lot of your work will be done by infantry, which includes squads of repeater and AV missile armed slugs who are more effective against both infantry and vehicles than you might think, and they can also heal themselves if they don't fully die in an engagement, even though they don't have the usual take cover ability allowing them to spread out and reduce incoming damage. More conventional enslaved multi-species infantry make up their guard platoons, which can be deployed in greater numbers, although with lower stats per troop. You'll always want to make sure you have a good mix of these two types of infantry, as well as some of the unique types of infantry that can come from their garrisons on defensive battles, or field bases on defensive or offensive battles. Supporting these all from afar with your MAL artillery is critical, and you'll also have a few skiffs able to provide different types of transporter support, though they and the additional speeder bike types you'll have should not be used as a front line. There are two types of speeder bikes including one that's armed with disruptors so make sure you check those out because disruptors really hurt, but for skiffs they have versions which can heal infantry, take out enemy infantry, and take out vehicles or aircraft with different types of missile pods, but they're all pretty role specific and shouldn't be kept around in the lines of fire for too long. Father Republic also has the anti-infantry Pongita, something that is not present in Thrawn's Revenge. You'll usually be holding your ground with your infantry and the WLO medium tanks along with different types of air power, and then when an engagement is already underway you bring in the skiffs of the type you need to finish things off pretty quickly since they are going to put out a lot of damage of whatever type you're bringing in. In Fall of the Republic the air power is in the form of anti-vehicle atmospheric flyers and the VAT gunship, which is my personal favorite ground unit in either of the mods right now. In Thrawn's Revenge, the air power is a bit more anti-infantry focused, with the Guardian 5E and AST instead of the VAT and Atmospheric Flyer. You can't move around the map to take out enemy structures the same way with these, but you can basically guarantee you're going to win any infantry engagement if you have these supporting your infantry. You can also hunt down enemy heroes like Jedi who have no answer to these. In exchange for their anti-vehicle gunships being gone, in Thrawn's Revenge there are the longer range anti-vehicle pod walkers. One of the things that the Huts are able to do really well overall, which we'll talk about in a second, is be very mobile. That's something the Podwalker isn't as good at, but the rest of the roster still is. You may be tempted to use your sail barge as a traditional heavy vehicle, but it's primarily meant for transporting infantry and supporting them in infantry fights, with its massive amount of anti-infantry cannons. It's not at all equipped to deal with enemy vehicles in any significant numbers. Those should be dealt with by your MALs, infantry, WLOs, and Podwalkers. We were just talking about mobility 
And one of the big things here is that with most of the hut roster being skiffs, they're able to go over water and other similarly limited types of passability. This and the raw speed of things like the skiffs means they are very good at taking out specific key areas of a map. The missile pod skiffs especially can get into the backside of a lot of bases on a lot of maps and take out structures before the enemy can do anything about it. If you're really looking for a heavy vehicle, the huts are pretty close to Mandalore, and much like the Hapens, the Candorous tank can be a great mobile complement to the rest of their roster. So trying to get to Mandalore and building up your influence quickly can really help you out long term, at least in Thrawn's Revenge, this does not apply in Fall of the Republic. And you should remember to make good use of your combat hut heroes like Perella the Hut, who are quite well equipped and fairly safe with healing capabilities. Some can even eat people. So if a hut, especially in Thrawn's Revenge, aren't able to make heavy use of force users, they probably still have among the most powerful set of ground infantry heroes in either mod. That should cover the basic strategy and content of the hut cartels, whether you want to play them in Fall of the Republic or Thrawn's Revenge. This information primarily applies to the .4 and maybe .5 releases, although in .5 and after, there may be some differences there. The huts have released in a pretty complete state for a first release, but there's always more we plan to do, and a few other ships and vehicles are coming their way. If you have any questions about what we've talked about today, please leave them in the comments. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.